So let's look at that first case, right? We talked about the 78 year old guy had this concerning chest pain. He was bradycardic and hypotensive. So let's look at those EKGs again. So looking at the EKG here that we had in the ED, looking at the rate, he's definitely bradycardic, right? And his rhythm is irregular. So I'm not gonna go into kind of figuring out type two um, heart block, type one and type two, but this was basically a second degree um, type one heart block. And this patient going through ischemia, going top to bottom, left to right, looking at one, we already see some ST depressions in one there. Moving to two, we see some ST elevations clearly at least one millimeter or one box above the baseline. So we draw a line from here to here, one box at least. And then in three, clear massive ST elevations, um, at least one millimeter. Going to ABR, some T wave inversions, but that's normal. ABL, significant ST depressions. ABF, significant ST elevation. So we know that the inferior leads, two, three, and ABF all have um, ST elevation. So we're thinking that there's inferior wall ischemia. Move into V1, we see some ST depressions. Move into V2, we have some more ST depressions. But then V3, we don't see any more ST depressions, right? So they're isolated to V1, V2. If you have isolated ST depressions in V1 and V2, you're thinking that the posterior wall is involved, especially if you have ST elevations in 2, 3, and ABF, because that right coronary artery supplies the right ventricle, which is also that posterior wall. So here, you're very concerned that this patient has an RCA infarct, um, which you would not want to treat with nitroglycerin, as you said correctly. Just to kind of finish off here, we can't really tell about any ischemic changes in V4, 5, and 6 because we have this PVC there. But just using uh, V3 here, we see that mainly the ST depressions are in V1, V2. So you guys were all right. Um, you would want to treat this patient with, this with fluid. And the reason behind that is these patients can get very, very sick. So he was hypotensive because he had RV involvement. So when he came into the ED, we took him straight to the cath lab. These patients that are bradycardic and have an inferior STEMI, we always place a transvenous pacemaker in them because we know that throughout the procedure, they're very unstable and it's very easy for them to go into heart block. So we place the transvenous pacemaker and while we're placing that, he goes into VT arrest. We shock him out of it, trying to get the pacemaker up there, codes again, VT arrest. We shock him out, finally place the pacemaker in, then we're getting your catheters up to get, uh, shoot the coronaries, VT arrest again. We're calling anesthesia during this time because he's altered. During this time, he codes again, we intubate him. And then finally, 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 what seems that like a lifetime, we're able to shoot his coronaries and this is what we see. So this is the right coronary artery. And as you can tell, it looks different than the other angios because now we're on the right side, but there's a 100% occlusion of that proximal RCA. So this was why he was hypotensive. And this is a big vessel, right? You can appreciate, we pushed a wire. We actually had to place a lot of stent in this coronary because he had a lot of clot and a lot of disease. But once we opened it up, you can see how big and beefy this vessel is. And it's supplying a big chunk of his heart. And as we remember from the rate slides, this RV actually supplies the SA node with one of its branches here. And it supplies the AV node with one of its posterior lateral branches. So that's why this patient was going into um, second degree type one heart block because he just had 100% occlusion of his big vessel. This wire here, just for you guys' kind of information, is the pacing wire. And as you can tell, it's just a free floating wire and it's actually really difficult sometimes to pace patients, especially if you're coding in between because this will not stay in place. You don't screw it into the wall, it just kind of floats there. So that just makes it even trickier and that's why he was coding intermittently. Well, he was coding from the VTAC, but it was very hard to kind of capture because it's just kind of like this flimsy catheter that sticks up against the wall. But I just kind of want to show you guys that these inferior STEMIs are very, very serious. So whenever you see ST elevations in the field, if you see someone um, that's stable, know that they might become unstable. So inferior and posterior STEMIs, right? Posterior STEMIs, we just said, ST depressions V1 through V3, it's important to note that they won't continue into V4, V5, V6, unless they're also having anterior wall ischemia, which would be rare for them to have a STEMI on the left and the right side of their coronary system. Next, right ventricular involvement, ST elevations isolated to V1, V2. Here is where you can hear about doing a right-sided V4 lead. And basically all that mean, means is taking that V4 lead from the left side and placing it on the right side in the same location. 
You don't actually have to do this. It's just something that can help you out. Um, we usually do it in the emergency room, but not always to really help uh, figure out this is a right ventricular infarct. But usually we figure that out based on the presentation. But if you do a right-sided um, lead, normally in, in the right ventricular infarction, D4 should not have any ST elevations. But if you move that lead to the right side, you will see ST elevations. The key with these patients is the treatment is not the same. Do not, do not, do not give them sublingual nitro because that will tank their blood pressure, that will decrease perfusion to their coronaries, and they will die and code on you. So you want to avoid nitroglycerin in these patients. They are preload dependent, meaning the fluid that they get um, coming into their heart is what's maintaining their cardiac output. So we want to blow these people up with fluids. So give them Lear bolus and route, and then we're going to give them more fluids. When they get here, we're going to start them on pressors. Obviously, all the other things that you normally do, put them on uh, pads, give them IV access, and um, give them aspirin. The important thing with pads is this is important not only because they might code on you, but also because you might have to transcutaneously, transcutaneously pace these patients. That patient that we just showed actually was paced when he came in because he was bradycardic to the 30s. Then when we took him off the pacing, we actually saw that he had a better underlying rhythm, but it fluctuated. I mean, he became bradycardic to the 20s on the table. So it's important that these patients have the pads on because you probably will have to pace them in route if they're hemodynamically unstable. So remember these leads, inferior stemmies are concerning, but also ST depressions in V1, V2, and then ST elevations isolated to V1, V2 are all um, indicative of right-sided, right ventricular involvement, meaning that the posterior wall is involved, that this person will need fluids and they could get very, very, very sick.